Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Business Day Focus 4.0 conference brought to you by Netstar in a partnership with ABSA, FedEx, Solidate, and GoSolar. My name is Nastasia Aronsa, and I will be your host for today. So this morning, we meet under the theme, the future of tech innovation and sustainability. So as a result, we'll have uh, two panels, and the one panel is going to be looking at AI and its impact on business logistics. Uh, we'll talk about the challenges and the opportunities. And that's because I think over the years we've realized that uh, businesses, both large and small, find themselves in this period where they're unsure on how to harness the power of uh, artificial intelligence in order to benefit their businesses. And yet, at the same time, we're in an environment where businesses are having to deal with market disruption, uh, geopolitical uncertainty but also faster technological advances. So the question then becomes is, how do C-suite executives evolve in order to be able to excel in this business environment that has this backdrop of all these factors playing out? Then the second panel is going to be looking at fostering and enabling environment for green energy, uh, green energy financing, that is. And following COP28, to many of you who may have been following some of the themes that came out of COP28, the role of business in driving sus the sustainable future um, has never been more critical. And what we're going to do in that particular panel is that, one, we're going to be talking about what the energy landscape looks like in South Africa, the financing aspect, but also not forgetting about the fact that you have businesses and investors trying to meet these ambitious ESG goals. So we're going to talk about how do you take these ESG goals that we've been talking about in order to drive that business value? Is there a link up? And where are the sort of pain points for a lot of businesses when it, uh, it comes to uh, measuring the progress as well as the impact? So we've got panelists who uh, make up a, uh, really great speakers and thought leaders who are going to be on stage to share those insights. And for those of you who are watching us online, um, very good morning to you as well. We're not forgetting all about you. We want you to engage with the conversation. So please use the chat facility that is going to be, um, you can find it on your screen. So at any point during the discussion, if there's something that you want to share in terms of a question, please um, Put those questions through, and I'll be able to see them on my side, and we're going to try to get as many questions uh, answered as possible. We also have a QR code, so if you want to follow part of the program, you can scan the code. That code is over there, so you can download the program and figure out, uh, well, get to see who the speaker is. So during the networking session, at the end of the event, you can approach that specific speaker if you have a question or you want to engage a little bit more. The other thing I wanted to mention is because we're going to be talking about technology and social media forms part of that technology, we do have a Wi-Fi password. So if you want to tweet uh, and, of course, download the program and engage in that manner, the Wi-Fi password is Future Tech. So if you look for uh, BD Focus 4.0, and you will be able to find it. And again, that password is Future Tech, um, all small letters. Without much further ado, I'm going to introduce my first panelists, and they're going to be looking at AI and its impact on business, uh, the logistics side of it, the challenges and the opportunity. So I'm going to introduce them. And one after the other, they're going to hop onto stage and have a seat, and then we're going to get into the conversation. First up, I'd like to welcome Patrick Devine, who is a data security specialist at Solidate Technologies. And then we have Clifford DeWitt, who is the chief technology officer at Altron Netstar. Yes, please hop onto stage. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> And the next panelist is Tando Mzinzilana, who is a professional IT and telecoms specialist. Let's see if he hops on stage. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Um, so we're going to get into the discussion, but as I mentioned to you guys, we're also going to have mics moving around for those in the room. Uh, if you have any questions, and again, online, please ask as many questions uh, as you can. Do feel free to put the gentleman next to me. In fact, all the gentlemen on stage on the spot, if you have any questions related 
<laughs> They've been ready for quite some time. So let's start with the fact that, I mean, we're talking about AI and its impact on business. But before we get to that, for quite some time, we've been talking about 4IR. And that has been a conversation that almost ramped up and got a little bit louder over the past couple of years, particularly in South Africa. And as much as we understand the dynamics happening globally, and we'll touch on those, let's bring it down a little bit to, from a South African context, where are we when it comes to those four IR ambitions, and we've had committees and various things and papers written. How are you seeing the landscape? And I, I want to start off with you. Uh, so, we're falling behind, eh? The, the focus is not there, the investments are, are, are drying up, if I can put it like that. Um, we, we, we are not competitive in many areas, although we do have very strong pockets of excellence, and that should be the focus should be on growing those pockets of excellence, not only in the private sector, but in some academic institutions as well. Uh, the focus should be on the pockets of excellence and expanding them rather than slogans and high-profile exercises in futility. I want to come back a little bit when, uh, we've get basic, when we get the viewpoints from all the others in terms of why those investments are drying up and where the pain points seem to be. And I'm curious to also understand how you're viewing those pain points. Um, Clifford, that 4IR conversation in relation to South Africa. Yeah, I, when I think about 4IR, often I think, you know, it's... We talk a lot about the capabilities of new technology in these technology waves. So, so, I mean, I think everybody probably knows this. The reason it's the fourth industrial revolution, a couple of the previous ones were the advent of steam, the invention of electricity. We're kind of living in this wave now where, I guess it's the combination of really high capacity compute, lots of compute power, plus I, I guess the technology really predicating around artificial intelligence. If you look at any of those industrial revolutions, I kind of split it into two pieces. The first, pe first piece is, are, able, are people able to consume the innovation? So if you look at electricity, are we able to, as a consumption community, take the benefits of that? And then the other side is, I guess, maybe where Patrick's going is, are we able to participate in the invention of the technology and the driving of the innovation behind it? If I kind of put that lens on the South African context, I would say on the consumption side, I don't think we're really, I don't think we're too far behind, right? I think we've always re been a reasonably good taker of technology that comes from, let's call it the West or the more modern world, right? And I think certainly in the private sector, we pride ourselves in actually having super smart people and doing very innovative things because I think the problems we face in our landscape are often quite different from the problems in a mature market. So I disagree in somewhat in that I think in the private sector, I've seen really interesting things happen using four-hour technology. And I can give you a couple of examples of what we've done with that, you know, in our company. I tend to agree a little bit on the pure academic and research and contribution side. I think there to be a producer or a contributor to 4IR requires a much bigger drive. It requires support from public institutions. It's a, it requires support into our research and academic environment because a lot of the innovation here is kind of happening in partnership with academic institutions plus private institutions. And it's, it's, it's fascinating because in this case specifically, if you look at things like artificial intelligence, it's really getting driven mostly by private institutions. If you look at what Meta's doing, if you look at what Google's doing, if you look at what Microsoft's doing in their support with OpenAI, a lot of these big innovations are actually coming from private companies that have huge amounts of funding and the ability to support that R&D. So maybe to answer your question, I think, I think we're doing pretty well on the consumption side and the usage of it in delivering value. I think we could do better in the R&D side. Tando, I described you in my intro as a, and I'm going to read it, as a professional IT and telecom specialist. So let's hear it from the specialist side. I mean, you've had that corporate experience, but you're also doing aspects where you are doing a little bit of the consulting side of things. So you're having that touch point with various businesses. That 4IR in a relation to South Africa, how are you viewing it? And I suppose it'd be great to hear the companies you're dealing with, how they're seeing it. Are they talking about it? Uh, is the conversation getting louder? Yeah, so in my view, I see a massive digital divide in terms of how technology is embraced, particularly with what Clifford is talking about now in the private sector. 
vis-a-vis the vast plains of South Africa, predominantly being rural and reliant on government for service delivery. And you, you look at, for example, what CSIR is doing mm. to support the mining industry mm. with AI and digital twinning, exactly. virtual reality, with co-funding with co -funding from government and private sector. I think there's a 50-50 contribution into that KETI. Of course, that plays a pivotal role in terms of leveraging on technology to enhance safety within the mining industry and also from an environmental point of view, driving efficiencies, logistics. Um, so there's a number of things that are happening in that space to drive and sustain the third contribution into GDP by mining uh, and the employment as well. So that being fair, fair and well, we're not seeing an acceleration of AI into service delivery. A typical example is when you look at private sector healthcare, you have systems that talk around electronic uh, health records. That's what you would ordinarily see and how AI is infused in, in assisting in that, mm -hmm. telemedicine. But you look at health in the public sector fraternity where a lot of the masses are reliant on, 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 on government's assistance for healthcare. You don't usually see that. Private sector healthcare is making huge leaps and bounds in leveraging on AI. A typical example, if you have a heart attack and you're insured, you're a school teacher. I think this is a typical example where you see, even in the United States, you are able to ask the doctor if your cover can, your, ins your, your health insurance cover can insure you for a particular procedure. You can tap into an app instead of reading through a lot of legal and um, benefit related stuff that you can't see on the naked eye, and it will give you a response almost in immediately. But when you go and look at, you know, public sector, rural areas, that's where the challenge is. We've got the nuts and balls to put it together. And, you know, from a scalability point of view, it's something that you know, can be done with immediate effect. So the digital divide is there by virtue of these scenarios that I've painted. And, you know, AI is not something of a misnomer in our macro environment. It's readily available, and it's just about how we embrace it and work together from a public-private sector point of view to make it a reality for all of the South Africans. And I'm glad you said that private-public uh, sector uh, point of view and working together, so I'm going to stay with you for this one. Why is it then that we're not seeing that AI deployment in that service delivery? Is it because there are other insurmountable challenges that the private sector can't deal with? What is the issue there? Because you would think that we can at least try and deal a little bit with it, try and at least try and fix it a bit or try and deal with certain stuff. What are the issues? So you could partly talk into around regulation. Okay. And one kind of hopes the NHI will probably bridge that divide in a meaningful way. I mean, it's not just about consolidation of resources from a monetary point of view from private sector to fund public sector institutions or enhancements of the facilities themselves from a brick and mortar point of view. But at the core of it, from a 4RI point of view, uh, you know, fourth industrial revolution point of view, you have to have technology at the center of those discussions. Um, you know, is there a particular paper or committees that are put together? I mean, a typical example of how CSI, CSIR has evolved in bringing in, in, in being in the front line for innovation in the mining industry. We need to more or less follow that blueprint on how we can really inculcate technology in and around the service delivery initi initiatives that we want to embark on. Let me come to you, Clifford. I was having a conversation with somebody and I was trying to understand where we are in terms of AI adoption, etc. And he gave me a historical comparison saying that the kind of pace we're seeing when it comes to AI adoption, where a lot of companies are looking at the new kid on the block, which is AI, is similar to what he had seen probably 18 or so years ago when it came to the idea of cloud computing. Yep. Is that the same thing? Are you seeing it uh, the same way? That uh, Are there historical comparisons here in terms of companies adopting it? I, th I think there's a similarity in with 
kind of adoption of new technologies. I think it often starts out with uh, the coolness factor, right? It's like a board hears about something and they go, oh my God, if we're not doing this, are we relevant? We better do some of this, right? And they often don't understand or the management team doesn't really understand what the this is, right? And I think there's a bit of that with AI, right? It's such a buzzword. Everybody's saying it. Everybody's sprinkling magic AI fairy dust on everything that they're doing. And so I think there is a little bit of a misnomer around what it should do and what it can do. And you're right, I think cloud computing was a bit that, but I think cloud computing was probably a little bit more practical in its understanding, and I think people probably understood it a little bit better. So I would say it had a little bit less of what we're dealing with in the AI world at the moment. I think the challenge is often, how does this technology practically help me either run my business better, serve my customers better, gain operational efficiencies? I think there's lots of things you can do with it. And I think... Lots of companies have made the mistake to try and say, well, we better do some AI, let's figure out what it is. And I've seen many instances of, of organizations sort of trying to force fit it into, the, into their products, into their solutions, without a clear vision of what they're actually asking it to solve or what they're actually trying to do with the technology. And those are the ones that tend to fail. They just want to put the two letters behind their product name because it sounds great on mm -hmm. marketing, right? I think the ones that succeed are very clear with the problems they're trying to solve and then using technology to solve those problems. And sometimes that's actually not AI. Sometimes that's just driving your call center in a more efficient way without using AI. It's just using better outbound call center technology or it's you know, using partners in a more efficient way. So I, I do think there is a trend in the way technology gets adopted and new technology. I mean, Gardner talks about the hype cycle and how that gets adopted. I think that's true in most cases. I think AI, because it's so multidisciplinary and it has so much application, is confounding it more so at the moment. And I guess my advice is be sort of clear on the problems you're trying to solve and use the right technology to solve those problems. Uh, Patrick, building on what uh, Clifford's just said in being clear and knowing the problems you're trying to solve, and I'm sure you've seen a lot of panelists outside or a lot of conversations about people understanding their digital transformation journey. We've had a lot of conversations around that. And the one thing I'd picked up out of those conversations was that the, the transformation journey is different for everybody else. At what point do you start looking back at your business and saying, I need to reevaluate my digital transformation journey if I need one? How do you view things as somebody who's working in that space? Well, to just get back to the bubble perspective, so all the, the, if you look at NVIDIA, the chip manufacturer, all the hallmarks of Netscape, which is before the cloud bubble in the 90s with the first web browser, it is, it, it's ticking all those, those boxes for being a bubble. Whether it is or isn't, we'll come back to your question. Yeah. So it's really about that intention. What do you want from this, right? But, but that's only part of it. A bigger part of it is what do you, how do you get it to learn and what data do you get it to learn from? And that's a, that's a massive issue on, based on the outcome. If you garbage in, garbage out, right? So, so it's that learning capability that is, 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 is immense in determining the outcome. Not doing that properly will spoil the outcome, right? So it's the, it's, you've, got to, you've got to really know what, what your outcome is before you go and clean up what you've got. And if you know, if you know what your outcome is, that becomes much easier. So let's stay with that. Do you want to add something to that? Yeah, look, you did ask me to name drop. And oh, sure. <laughs> so this past Monday, I think it's quite interesting that you asked this question. I had coffee with Tony Serra, who's the group CIO for CAEI. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the key things that he's been trying to do over the past eight years is to transform the organization by interacting with vendors that can offer anything as a service. And it's been quite a pain point where, even in my previous life, the models that we take to customers are quite rigid in and around offering particular services. So some of the barriers of entry for companies that want to embark on AI and infusion is the price for professional services. In certain instances, because of scarcity of skills in the country, you know, so, so, you know the, there's, there's a, a dollar-based denomination either from a professional service point of view or consumption. 
And there's obviously the variability of billing where you don't have a consistent price. And inevitably, most enterprises, even though there's an intent to digitally transform the organization, there are those challenges that can impede the, the, the transition in and around how, how the predictability and how it aligns to budget. Yes. So those are some of the things that you know, he, has to, he had to navigate over the years and having to land on the, on the premise that whoever that he was going to work with had to be a local entity within South Africa and the services that he consumes would primarily be RAN based that gives him predictability. And also you can switch off and switch on services as and when you scale up the organization up and down. So I think those are some of the subtle nuances that you know an organization has to take into consideration where you do a thorough analysis around how you're going to yep. you know, shape up and, and move forward embracing technology. Okay, can I add to that? I love the example, um, and it's interesting, again, to look back in history. So, so let's use the electricity example. Because when electricity was invented, you, there was no utilities. So the early adopters of electricity were factories that were predominantly steam-driven because they had the biggest demand for electricity because it allowed, there was lots of advantages. When you were a steam factory, you had this big steel pole that came from the steam engine, and all the sewing, sewing machines, or all the machines that required propulsion kind of fed from a, a big belt that came off this thing. And it determined the factory layout because you need to have this big pole, so all the machines had to basically sit close to this pole because it was a big belt that came. from. When electricity came around, now you could have an, a flexible wire and you could basically put the machines wherever you wanted them. And this allowed the kind of concept of the production line to sort of start evolving because now you could follow the flow of your goods through your factory instead of to having them rigid. So people realized this, but then they were like, if I need to use electricity, I, there was no ESCOM at the time, there was no grid. So basically what they did is they took the steam engine out the back of the factory and they built an electricity plant at the back of the factory. So now all these factories became specialists in creating electricity. And then after a while, what happened was they realized, well, if you do it at a utility level, you can do it more efficiently, you can do it at scale and hopefully at a cheaper price. I'm sure our next panel, when we talk about solar, is going to contradict that because now we're generating electricity at home again. Completely different conversations. So let's just stay with my one. We'll can, that's for you in the next panel to discuss. <laughs> but if we think about the adoption of AI, now let me bring it to the conversation. It's kind of a similar thing, right? So I think the conversation we've just had about Tony and what he's trying to do with his organization the adoption of new technology often involves initially you having to be the expert. So now I want to use AI in my organization. I have to go and find these clever data scientists, pay them huge amounts of money because they need to solve very specific problems that I'm dealing with in my organization because I can't go and buy that software off the shelf. Mm -hmm. But what's starting to happen, and I kind of look at it again, look at my organization. I work for NetStar. We produce fleet tracking software. We, we track vehicles. Well, it's true of what I'm having to do. I'm having to go and build those technologies. But my point of view on this is that it should be my responsibility to build AI into my technology so that I can give it to my customers in an easy-to-consume manner so that they get the benefits of using AI, but my customers don't have to go and hire data scientists and do the heavy lifting. So it's kind of like that electricity example. Eventually, you turn on a light switch, you just expect electricity to come out the light. You don't have to worry about all the nuances of where it came from, how it's generated, the power plant, and the maintenance behind that. And I think AI is kind of going down that road. What's happening is we're starting to build technology into our solutions that we then sell to our customers. And what we should do is make it easy for our customers to get the advantages of AI without having, without having to be specialists in their own right. And I think that's the transition that's starting to happen at the moment. So, so just to add to, to previous points from you, and so the term is the democratizing of the analytics. So putting the, the people at the coalface, the ability to ask the questions and get the answers without having to rely on the back end, the international companies, the data scientists, it's the people at the coalface asking and getting the questions when they need it, which again determines what you build on, right? Yeah. Because you can't put highly confidential information into the hands of the people at the coalface. So there's a lot of the back-end stuff that needs to be fixed before the, this capability is available. With that said, let me stay with you here. As a data security specialist, at what point of that, and I, 
I hate to use this phrase, but we've been using it for so long. At what point of the digital transformation journey do companies bring you in to either advise them on that data management or whatever, or to even help them fix what they've been doing? When wrong? they're on the front page of the Tuesday <laughs> <laughs> for a ransomware attack. <laughs> um, no, so, 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 so look, uh, uh, there's no generalizing. Some companies don't do it very well, and others don't do it well at all. Um, the earlier, the better. So companies get data, they get data, they, the, all companies, all organizations have got historical data. Mm. They're taking new data in every day from the call center, from the website, from the branch, from the app. You should be protecting your data at the initial, when it's coming into the channels and then your back end stuff. People should have access to it based on their job functions. Do they need it? People, it's very difficult. It's a difficult challenge. It is. How prevalent is, because I think over the past, couple of months or so, locally we've read articles where there have been cybersecurity hacks, whether it's a state-owned entity, division, or a department, or even some of the private companies. And you can't obviously speak to what has been happening internally, but what are some of the oversights that we don't think about when it comes to that security, especially as it relates to people's data? Well, so, so, so the, the big problem is people don't know what they have, right? So all this data is coming in from all these channels, all the historical stuff's there, and the, the systems are producing data, employees are producing data, it's being consumed by partners. It, you know, that's the, just there's a data explosion, right? There's too much, and it's largely invisible. So it's how you compartmentalize that data. Put your highly secure, top-secret stuff with extra care, and put your... Like, public stuff you don't have to worry about. But you can't treat everything the same. It's being able to understand what you've got, it's having it visible, and it's, it's, uh, the earlier you pick up that discussion, the easier it is going forward. Clifford, as um, you know, Netstar, you collect a lot of data. A lot. <laughs> How have you gotten to the point where you've pretty much nailed the art of managing that data securely so we don't have any problems and you're not on the cover of the business day? Yeah, look, I guess as a, as a CTO, I, I would be lying to you if I, if I said I didn't lose sleep about security. And I think anybody who says they have the security nailed is lying, right? I think you can look at any company that gets targeted, probably there is a vulnerability. So I think that's the first thing we, we think about is we, 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 we think about always being on the watch and never being complacent. So, so that's, that's sort of one of the approaches we take. I, I think Patrick's advice on looking at the various types of data you have and classifying it is certainly true. So you're absolutely right. You know, we have customer data where it's our customers' records, their addresses, their personal information. We keep that in one system. We have all of that, tons of telematics data. Get. So we get you know, close to 180 billion data points a month that we get into our organization. It's a, but that's sort of all of those location pieces of data. And we think about where we store that and how we process that and how we archive that over time. Um, I would say it's an evolving discipline, though, because what is happening, Patrick's point is super valid, is that over time we're getting better and better at collecting more and more data. And so we are constantly looking at our data estate and saying, well, where do we store our data? How do we process our data? And how do we expose it? I kind of use a mining analogy with this. So, sorry, I like telling stories. We, we, that's great. <laughs> storytelling. <laughs> But, but it's kind of like the process of mining. And, and mining, there's sort of three big phases. You mine the stuff, you take a bunch of raw material out the ground, then you refine it into some type of raw product. So the refining turns gold into sort of big ingots and stuff. And then if you look at the jewelry trade, that is often the consumption side of at least precious metals, we, we, I talk about it as the shining phase. We turn that into the product that people want. So we think about our data in those two areas. We think about how do we mine huge amounts of data, and that's where the big volume is. Then we refine it into sort of a more valuable product and how do we store and secure that? And then the shining phase is sort of how do we turn that into some type of business value that we can give to a fleet operator or a consumer to get some insights out of. And so we, we think about the security boundaries on each of those stages of our data journey is kind of how we think about it. As a technology uh, officer, Along those years or in your time, uh, in your experience, how hard has it been to get buy-in from finance in terms of what you need to be doing for your division to yeah. help change the business around? Because she's asking the tough questions. <laughs> Look, I think anybody who's sort of worn a C-suite hat, uh, sits around an Exco table, always understands the, 
the debate between the cost centers in the organization, <laughs> being normally the IT organizations and the finance team, right? Look, to answer your question, I, I think I find working with, with CFOs always interesting. My, my advice is often, if you, if you take your CFO on the journey that you're on, if, you, if you're not just standing there saying, I need money, but if you explain why you need it, and often in a technology company, it's probably some ways a little more interesting because most CFOs in a technology company tend to understand why they need to invest in IT because it is the product that you sell and what you put into the market. So, but they remain CFOs often, right? So, of course, they're always going to ask you the tough questions around why and shouldn't it cost less and how can you save more money? But, but, but honestly, I think it's about taking your, your, your organization, and this is true of probably every member on an exco, is to be joined together in the way you're going in terms of your strategy to understand that and to buy into that then I think investment becomes an easy conversation often, right? Because I think we all know where we're going. We understand the priorities that we have in the organization. We understand the investments behind those priorities. I think it's when you come left field and say, you know, we've just, well, I think we need to spend X new million rand on a security product and nobody's ever talked about that. That's when it becomes an uncomfortable conversation. The one as did you want to add something to that before? Yeah, I think if you haven't spent time with a security expert or a CISO in the last three years, you most likely won't, see, won't even see it coming. Mm -hmm. yeah. And once something happens, it's too late. Yeah. And, you know, when you look at business development from a strategic point of view, it's easy to talk about professional services, and there's a slew of services that fall under that belt. But when it comes to issues of security, you know, uh, you know, Patrick can allude to this, that, you know, you know intrusion detection, uh, are some of the skill sets that sit behind that, that you ordinarily would want to do, you know, periodically within your organization. And as Clifford is talking around the evolution of security, it's not the same as, you know, practice as it was to the T three years ago. Exactly. Uh, you, you need to inculcate duality on it, you know, some of the telcos and the system integrators will invite customers to come and look at their, you know, at their SOC and, you know, and all the screens and all the important things that they do to, to showcase the capability and how they manage their environment and how they can potentially, you know, manage your particular environment. But I, I always had a practice that I encourage of over and above showing off what you can do and your capabilities, you visit the customer yeah. and look at their environment. And then it starts talking to seeing the CFO, they have the duality of showing them the shiny right. you know, armor vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, looking at the customer's environment and infrastructure thoroughly. In that, you are able to look at probably compliance-related issues if you're in manufacturing, uh, you are able to look at, you know, in healthcare, your HIPAA compliance issues, there's a whole host of things you see with the naked eye when you go there in person, as opposed to just sitting in boardrooms presenting your capability. Immerse yourself into the customer's environment yep. because they're all unique. Yep. In there you'll find and tailor make solutions that talk to the customer, and then you can have the periodic assessments as you go along. So, so just to add to that, I mean, uh, prior to, to, to ChatGPT and all the hype around it, I mean, getting people to clean up their data was always a good security practice, was always a good business practice, but people didn't do it. Now, in order to leverage the AR, they have to do it, right? So, so it's taking people on a, from a grudge purchase to an enabling purchase, and that's the journey that you referred to, Clifford. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point you make. I was going to kind of make it now, is that I think sometimes the things that we deal with, certainly in the security world, mm. he said it, they, they grudge insurance purchases. Yeah. It's, it's the thing that you need on a rainy day. And so often it's easy to say, oh, well, I think we're okay, let's not do as much here, right? So it's much like buying insurance, right? It's like you, you, you don't need it until you need it. Whereas I think some new product development or the innovation on building something new or a new feature for whatever you're doing it's very tangible. If we don't do it, we're not going to get the revenue. If we do do it, hopefully we'll get the revenue. So 
I think that's often the issue with many of the challenges you face on, on the security side of the world, is that it's hygiene. It's stuff that you know you should do, but you don't know that you'll ever need it. And, and that's where the challenge sometimes sits. So just, just to yeah. add there again, it's about trust, right? It's the consumer's got to trust you. How do you build that trust? You've got, you, you ha there's certain things you have to do, it, and it's becoming... So, so the whole AI, uh, uh, from a security risk, there are so many points where AI is at risk. It's not only the data coming in, it's the manipulation, it's the data coming out. Having the trust of, 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 of your consumers is, is, is paramount, and having good security practice is a big part of that. I'm glad you brought up uh, chat GPT because I think everyone's been writing about it. People have experimented a little, little bit with small little tasks or small little cues or questions that you may have. Are there aspects about that space that either scare you right now or excite you? And which one is leaning on the other? Is it more the scary bits or is it more the exciting bits? And Patrick, let me start with you for that because you so, brought it. So, so you've mentioned the electricity and the steam. So, so the, one of the early analogies that, that's really stuck with me is if you were there seeing the first kettle boil and generate steam and somebody said look at that or Thomas Edison pressed a button and a light bulb came up would you as a human being know what that impact would have on civilization I think that's where we're at right now this is not me saying this, this is something I read I think anyone who's telling you where the AI journey will end up doesn't really know what they're doing or they're missing a part of it um, but I think I'm equally excited and, and, and nervous about it because it is right now it's driven by these tech entrepreneurs that, that there's no controlling them. It can end up as a nightmare. There has to be some kind of regulation. There has to be some kind of consumer protection out there. But, but it's, it's exciting times, eh? Tando? You have to look at the ethical consideration in decision-making when embarking on an AI journey. And, you know, you've got examples of explainable AI, which is referred to as XAI, um, and then you have other instances. So explainable AI will have base model and post hack that you can feed and ingest data in. And what explainable AI does is the output, it gives you an explanation of why it would decline a transaction. Whereas other AI models, uh, particularly black box, I don't know why it's called black box, uh, it could easily be in purple box, would be hidden code that you are unable to see and if it makes a decision, you will not have any visibility on the parameters that led to that. A typical example of infusing AI in, let's say, financial institutions, approval of a home loan, it's declined and you've got AI infused behind it. And that, you know, you, you're not even aware if there might have been code that's put behind there to say if you're of a certain ethnic, ethnic, ethnicity, or race, you know, there's a certain outcome or result. We've kind of seen those type of examples come up in and around questionable decisions. Questionable decisions that are made by humans, but ordinarily when you infuse AI, there's still that danger in and around what's lying underneath the code and how you're doing your assessments and scoring, you know, different people based on different regions. So there has to be a lot of care around the ethical considerations on decision making when I'm, you know, putting AI in place. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to it a little bit, right? I mean, actually, so the challenge with AI is, is that actually there isn't any code because the code is learned. The best analogy I've, I've, I've seen, I read a research paper the other day. Some guy built a model to do detection of images and determine whether that medical scan actually had cancer or not. And I sat with the researcher and I said, wow, that is a really impressive piece of work. Can you tell us how the model works? And he said, I have no idea. And that is the challenge with AI. It's a fundamentally different way of creating software. So um, basically the way we've created software up until now has been with programmers. And programmers have programmed a computer to do certain things. You say, if I get these five things, evaluate these two, plus this, minus that, and the answer is B. Right? So it's been the human who's determined the algorithm. With AI, what we've done is the, way, the best way to think about it is the same way a child learns to walk. We create a brain, a very, sim very simple brain today, but it's an artificial brain. And then what we do is we give it training data. 
We give it stuff, and we say, we would like you to learn how to walk. And this is how you learn how to walk. And if you fall over, we penalize you for falling over. And if you start stumbling, and we, we reinforce it. So this is what's called reinforcement learning. So actually, as humans, we don't know how the AI learns, to be honest today. What we've done is we've just taught it stuff. And this is Sandra's point on, on kind of explainability, because if we haven't created the algorithms ourselves, the, the model has just learned how to do it, we're not really sure what it will do under all situations. It might have learned strange things and done strange things, and this is where we are in the world of AI at the moment. Now, the concept of explainability is trying to reverse engineer that model and say, well, can you show me why you've done certain things? It's a great concept, but it's really very, it's, it's early days for that. And it's us putting guardrails. I'll give you a turn now. <laughs> he's, he's yes, jumpy. Sanders is <laughs> waiting to share his point. It's us getting jumpy to say, well, there's been many scenarios in AI doing strange things and having strange outcomes that we really aren't too comfortable with. And this is why we're starting to put guardrails around these AI worlds. I mean, the one example I use a lot is that the US Department of Justice built a system to recommend to judges what sentence to give people that they'd found guilty. They built a very clever AI model. They trained it with thousands and thousands of cases. So it was based on their own case history. And they used this in production for a while. And then they realized over time that this model was racist. But they'd never, ever trained it with race data. There was never race in their training data. But because of the way the data was amassed and some weird nuance in the training data, this thing had learned race. And this comes to the point of explainability, because if you didn't write the model yourself, you can't really always predict. And, 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 and it was really interesting, because judges believed the data that came out of it, because they, it was supplied by their own IT system. They, they believed that this thing gave them sound advice. So, so I, I guess this is the kind of the debate we're, we're kind of getting into with AI. Now, coming back to your original question, sure. are, are we excited about it? Absolutely. And I think we should be, right? Because the one thing about technology is that if you don't adopt it, somebody else will, and it will take its own, it, it takes its own path. If, it, if, and, and I fully agree that we need some regulation and government kind of to weigh in on it, but if you look at any technology revolution, whether it's electricity, steam, or anything else, what tends to happen is the technology comes, kind of runs up the front, and then regulation kind of follows behind it as we, and this is true of where we are right now. We're probably running quite far ahead in terms of what AI can do and what its capabilities are, and I think regulation and kind of people with a conscience are sort of starting to sound the alarms and putting some belts and braces in place. I think we should adopt it. I mean, you asked about ChatGPT specifically. We actually have a project right now at the moment where I'm using ChatGPT to provide a nat natural language interface into our world of telematics and tracking. Mm -hmm. And it's fantastic because now instead of a human having to go and use this very complicated piece of software and know where to log on and know where to click, I'm actually just producing a very simple interface and you can type the things that you want into that interface. I want to know where my car is right now. Please show me the loss five trips I've done over the last month. I think, well, pause your natural language, your English, or we can make it multi-language even. It's so easy to do that because it speaks multiple languages, and it gives you the data that you answer. Now, that's fantastic, but we're doing it in a very confined way in our space. So I think we should adopt this technology, but the warnings around explainability and being conscious about its biases should be really loud in front and center as well. No, he touched on it. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> I wanted to touch on the biasness because when you train an AI, you ingest data. So the different yes. data sets that you would ingest in terms of the tools and processes that you're utilizing. And if you, your model, so there's a percentage that you'd get, it's 67%, you know, it gets to 99. If it gets to 100, you have a problem. It should not inevitably get to 100%. Over 30 but the most important thing about it is that when you're ingesting that data, if there's bias in that data, it. it can then lead to the ethical considerations in terms of decision making. I agree with Clifford around the underlying functions is that there's, no, there's primarily no real coding, but there's you using tools and processes to get a specific outcome. So it's, 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 it's quite important that as and when the the, the, the engineers embark on the journey 
of trialing and testing, there has to be stops in and around how that data is collated, what is the spectrum of the data, and what is it meant to represent holistically. So there's quite a number of things you need to do as opposed to an individual in isolation embarking on that journey that will have consequences down the line. Yes, AI will make mistakes along the way, but there's always an opportunity to pick up that mistake and then correct it by re-ingesting the correct narrative around the biasness aspects of it. Yeah. Where does so yeah. just to add that, that, that that's not an AI issue, it's an algorithm issue. So today, apply for a job with HR, apply for a loan, 99% of the population get yes or no without any interaction with a human being. It's the 1% that can interact and say, why did, was my... The rest of us, we got no chance, right? That's already there. It's not, it's not AI, it's already... Yeah. Where does regulation fit in this AI story? Yeah. Cliff? So, so, I, so I guess what I was alluding to, and I, I guess, again, following the trend, I think it's going to catch up. So I, I absolutely feel there is a regulatory piece that is required. Um, and you can kind of see the movement building, especially in the US and Europe at the moment. Um, you can see the, the cries for it happening. You know, I think GPT was a very big wake-up call for the community, both in terms of capability, but also in terms of what it got wrong. You know? I think that's sometimes the interesting things. What it gets right is fascinating. What it gets wrong is scary, right? So I think there's been a very big wake-up call with the latest advances in GPT around, oh, wow, what could this do, and what are the regulatory requirements behind this? So I do believe they will catch up. However, I guess my one concern is that there is, there is so much R&D and funding happening in this environment that it's running really fast, right? And that I guess my concern is that the technology will kind of always run so far ahead that the regulatory capabilities or the regulatory requirements will always be playing catch up, right? And, and, and I think that is a concern, certainly uh, even, in, even, in the, even in the sort of most advanced, uh, in the most advanced research community. So, you know, there was a recent call from a very well-known professor at Harvard who said, we should just pause all AI research for six months, just so, we can kind of take a breather, catch up, that the governments of the world and the regulatory bodies can kind of see where we are, and then we can kind of go again. And actually, that paper was signed by a huge number of people, including Elon, including a whole bunch of people. But it's a really hard bus to stop, right? Because the challenge is, is that you're dealing with private institutions now who've received funding, who have boards demanding returns on their investment. Yeah. Very difficult as a CEO of a public company to walk into your board and say, you know what, we're just going to stop doing stuff for six months because it's the right thing to do. I don't think many boards are going to take that well. So I think it's a challenge. Uh, to answer your question again, there's certainly a space for it. I, I definitely feel like any sort of well-balanced world, there needs to be a balance between sort of blue sky, we can do whatever we want, yeah. and what are the regulatory slash compliance requirements in terms of, well, you can do that, but you need to at least min minimally meet these requirements. And I think we're in virgin landscape at the moment in terms of what those belts and braces need to be, to be honest. So what I'm going to do now is that I'm going to pause my side of the questions because I already see some questions coming through online. But I'm also going to open the floor to um, audience members who do have questions. Uh, we do have a mic uh, that's going to be moving around. So if you do have a question, uh, please uh, raise your hand and then we'll have a mic to you and then you can just stand up and introduce yourself and then tell us who your question is directed to. There are... Uh, few questions that have come in. So the first one reads, and you guys will let me know who wants to take it. AI adoption in business currently is like aiming to shoot bats in the dark. The marketing induces FOMO, and the issue for me is, is it really applicable in all sectors or industries? Tafid, do you want to take that one? I'll take it, yeah. I think it's a great, I think it's a great comment. I, 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 I agree with it. Um, I sort of alluded to it previously. I, I, think, I think lots of, and, and you kind of mentioned the marketing FOMO, right? I think a lot of 
companies want to say they have AI in their products because they want it on the marketing line. That's my fairy dust example, right? You want to sprinkle some AI fairy dust on your product and say we, we have it. Um, it's certainly not the answer to all questions. I think I've seen lots of instances where people try to solve very simple problems using AI that could just be done. I kind of used that example earlier. It could be just done purely algorithmically and probably better, right? So if I just want to filter my data by year, I don't need an AI algorithm to do that. I can just do that using a very simple algorithm. So sometimes getting to the outcome, and that's, and that's why I'm obsessed about what is the outcome. If you, if you deal with what the problem is you're trying to solve and you and you have your engineering team or your partner team or your, the solutions that you buy deliver those results, whether they're powered by AI or not should not matter. I think there are some very hard problems that AI is really good at solving that you can't solve with normal solutions or normal computing. But that doesn't mean that a lot of the things that you do should be done with AI. I think AI is the right tool at the right time, right? And, and, and I think often when it comes top down, when we want to have to use AI just because we want to, that's when the problems start, right? So my advice is stay focused on solving the problems that you have, not force fitting a technology into your environment. Yeah. The next question says, should the teachability index for respective sectors be established first before discussing AI to mitigate the risk of losing technical skills accumulated over decades, insights that can actually enhance AI? Great question. <laughs> Let's see. Yes, who are I, I just think the human element is always going to be there. We always need those checks and balances. It can't be automated to the nth degree. There needs to be a, 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 a managed situation. Tando, you can take this one, and I think that ties in quite nicely with the piece you wrote uh, recently. This question reads, how do we develop disciplined youth in this field? And I suppose, let me add in an aspect of um, skills along the chain as we move along this tech, to, uh, tech space. Um, how do we think about all of that stuff, youth, skills, I suppose even women in the idea of the 4IR or AI, etc.? Well, women have to be in the forefront in the fourth industrial revolution because when you had the second industrial revolution busting at the seams in the early 1900s up until the third industrial revolution, you've had a lot of women being left out in the bustling industries. Um, we have an opportunity now not only to consolidate global economic growth, but a much more inclusive and equitable fashion would be the inclusion of women in the adoption of big data and AI. I say this because it's an opportunity to bring in more innovation. Um, you know, a bulk of the innovation that has taken place has been skewed. So you're leaving half of the population and expecting better results, it's not going to happen. But when you look at reskilling, it's multifaceted because you might be competent in something today, but inevitably with technology, there's going to be certain competencies that fall by the wayside, similar to how the horse and buggy Correct. took place at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And when you look at certain industries now, I know BCX has embarked on hackathons and and getting the youth involved. I think Vodacom does it as well. Those are some of the initiatives that don't necessarily require you to be a big corporate to embark on. And looking at South Africa from a geographical landscape, you know, depending on what your purpose is as an organization, you can then bring in youth to, and expose them to the technology and try and solve the basic problems. To Clifford's point in around deploying AI for the sake of having a sticker, I think if you have a clear purpose around enhancing customer experience, improving decision making, and also, you know, making sure that you optimize operations, those are the smaller building blocks on how you can start getting that done. Yeah. And when you get youth pulled in, through events like Hackathon with real life scenarios, you'd be surprised what comes out of the wash. And encouraging the next you know, generation to 
partly look at things with on a purposeful perspective as opposed to doing a diploma or a degree to have it as a watch, but rather real-life scenarios and challenges, safety, security, education. There's a slew of things in which, you know, you can infuse AI in for in, in terms of solving real-life problems. Yeah. And in that lies a whole host of business opportunities that can really grow our economies. So from start with, start with purpose. Yeah, that's... And... Make sure that, you know, in most of the programs, it, it can even be sport. Yeah. You can infuse technology there around. Not everyone can be a Siako Lisa Jostransky. You can be a linesman or you can look at stats statistically and how the game is played, improving it. So there's a, lot, there's a whole host of things in which you can infuse technology and have positive outcomes. Clough and Patrick, I have a question, can I just generally. Uh, the you're talking about the digital divide. For me, the, the rural area is so ripe for satellite internet connectivity that we're just not embarking on. Do you not think that that's something that we should as a country be pushing as a way of dealing with the digital divide? Yeah, most definitely. I mean, you know, I've been in the telco space for the past 17 years and there's a lot of different initiatives that are being embarked on. I mean, talk about what is being done in the mining sector and deploying cell, 5G cells to enhance, you know, your radar systems and your edge computing. Similar systems can be deployed in rural, er rural areas. Uh, you know, it does not necessarily have to be satellite only. Uh, you've got microwave, multi-hops. Uh, but we're sitting with a solution already there and no one wants to talk to them. Yeah, so... It's always a, a give and take, but I know some of these telcos have a, a mandate from ICASA in terms of you know, initiatives that they need to do in rural areas and roll out infrastructure. And the question is, you know, how far are they in meeting that quota? And Starlink's right there, just needs to be turned on. Why, why aren't we doing that, is my question. It's a million dollar question. Okay. No, no. I mean, I think no. it's also probably similar to your undersea cable and entities that can hop into it. So similar mo commercial models will come in. Mm -hmm. Starlink has to partner with certain service providers and find the right partners to scale the solution. They're not going to do that, right? They're not going to give away 30% of their business. We're in a stalemate and the, digit the rural people have stuck behind. I think it's a problem. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, if you don't have internet in people's hands, you, you miss a big boat in and around the inclusivity. Uh, and I think... It will talk to a lot of things around not just having internet, but the correct bandwidth to consume content is important. Uh, I mean, a typical example out. Yeah, you want to go for it? Oh, sorry, sorry. Not finish. You know, a couple of years back, in 2013, to be precise, my team won a deal with the Department of Education in the Eastern Cape. And it was quite a transformational deal because there were 5,000. 5, 300 data lines, and within those data lines, there were 2,600 laptops that were deployed. Mm. Uh, now, at that time, in hindsight, it seemed to be transactional. You drop the hardware, the department then will distribute the, 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 the resources to the schools. And these were primarily lower quantile schools, meaning that they're in rural areas, and some of the schools don't even have addresses. Because initially the request was that, well, you go and distribute the hardware, you know, into these schools. And we're like, most of them don't even have addresses. But the most important aspect around the deployment is the network layer in those rural areas. You can deploy a laptop with a 3G connection at the time, but if they are unable to connect, they won't be able to use SA SAMs, which was an, administra an administration uh, a software that was embedded on the laptops. So connectivity is, is key, and the quality of that connectivity is important. Um, I mean, of course, now, the deployment, you know, if, it, you know, so those who know the Eastern Cape, it's geographically massive. It was split between three distribution uh, areas or collection centers in Gabecha, which was formerly known as Port Elizabeth, in King Williamstown, and in Mtata. So all the school teachers in these previously disadvantaged areas had to commute to collect and get verified if they're, they're the right person there. And then 
with all the data, I'm cutting a very long, detailed, rich story short, with all the data we had in 2013, the geospatial mapping of our sites, the, the GPS coordinates of the schools, and the school teachers per cell, take all that information without changing anything and infuse it in Azure yeah. or Google, uh, Google Cloud Platform, leveraging an explainable AI, you would have a different customer experience altogether. Yeah. Because now, then we had to eventually establish a contact center for when laptops are stolen, who the teachers can call, there's a lack of coverage. With it. You put an explainable AI to enhance the customer experience. The customer now expands it using a URL. If your laptop is stolen, you can use the internet and put your personal number as a teacher to interrogate if you are eligible for another laptop. Yeah. If you already had an instance where the laptop has been lost twice, it will reject you and give you an explanation of how to. Mm -hmm. um, you also have to understand that it's not transactional when you do these type of transformational deals. It's a journey where you can lock in a customer for a longer period. I mean, we were with that contract for well over eight years because of the sheer scale and how you infuse yourself. Because we also had, we were invested in seeing how SASAMS works and the type of output that comes up to enhance you know, learning within the Eastern Cape and improving learnership within the previously disadvantaged schools. So long-winded, but when you look at the, the infusion of AI and where it can purposefully improve scenarios that we've been exposed to in the past yeah. would be a starting point. And also, you know, when you look at the, 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 the regulatory environment and all the things that we've discussed, there's a lot of things to consider in using it responsibly and how it can help change lives. We've got a couple of minutes left and there are two questions. And the one I'm actually going to tie it in here. Cliff, do you want to take this one? And I think it kind of ties into what he was talking about in regards to um, having youth involved in women, etc. Can I put you on the spot? Oh. When you're sitting in an interview room and you're looking for somebody to join Netstar, yeah. what are you looking for from a skills perspective that yeah. can help in this AI journey, in your AI yeah. journey for Netstar? Yeah. And perhaps let me ask you um, the same question. When you're sitting there and there's a young man, young woman, young lady sitting there trying to be part of this world that we talk about, what are you looking for? Curiosity and drive, those are the two things that... Okay, curiosity and drive. It's all my word, I was gonna use curiosity. <laughs> so, so, so to be honest, I mean, and it's, so, so in my previous life, I, I, I worked for Microsoft for many, many years, and um, coming back to your learning question a little bit, <coughs> we built a, a program to take unemployed graduates and turn them into professional software developers. It was something that I started, Super proud of that we produced probably three, four hundred software engineers. And, and these kids were unemployed at the time. And, and the one quality that I think we saw with the kids that really made it was the ability, it's that, curiosity is an interesting word, but it's, I think it's this, the, the, the ability to learn. And so I, I always think about that back into the interview question, right? Because I think a lot of, even the previous question was around, well, do we have the skills to do this? You know, that problem is going to be there tomorrow in a different fashion. So the only way you, you prevent or, or you build the resilience against that is if you have people in your organization who really want to learn. And learning in this environment, in technology environment, actually in most environments, is a lifelong journey. It's not like, okay, I've got my degree, I'm done now, and I'm going to you know, write C Sharp or C++ or whatever the technology is at the time for the rest of my life, right? So I, I think having somebody who has the curiosity to learn and go and spend some of his own personal time learning and spend the time on the internet when you have the internet connection to skill yourself. Those are the type of people that end up changing organizations because tech is gonna change, we're gonna invent new things, and if you don't stay current, your relevance to the organization wanes over time. So, especially in technology world. But you know, that's true of actually anything. I mean, you don't want to go to a doctor who last read a paper 
when he graduated, right? He's probably not too current on what's happening in the world at the moment. So I think that's true in most organizations. Okay, so let's wrap it all up. In 30 seconds, I'll start off with you, uh, Patrick. What should we be thinking about as we think about AI, um, data management, uh, security, all of these things? What's the one key takeaway for the audience not just here, but online. So it's, it's that drive to learn new stuff. It's the same thing. There's nothing new. Yeah, that's what we need to do, right? So and to just reiterate, what do you want to achieve? Start there and work backwards how you get there. And make sure that what you're feeding into the large language module is fairly accurate. Clifford? Yeah, I guess I would wrap up by saying we really... I do believe we're in a technology revolution, and I don't think they're linear. So I do think we go through waves in our world, and I think we're actually in a reasonably big breaking wave at the moment. So there is a massive opportunity. I, I think about two things. I think about, as an organization and as a country, are we equipped to consume the benefits of that wave? So how do we, as a private sector, make sure we consume that technology and provide value back to our customers? And then as a South African citizen, I worry a lot about us being equipped to build the skills, retool our, our country to be able to capitalize on that. We're going to move out of a resource-based economy into a digital and knowledge economy at some point. right? We're going to have to at some point build some resilience on the fact that most of the money in our country comes from mining gold and mining resources. And I guess that's the long-term thing around this AI technology world is do we have enough resilience in our world to make sure that we are participating in the production side of this technology wave? Tando? I think first and foremost, you have to find purpose in and around whatever that you do, whatever environment you're in. I mean, it's proven that AI transcends across industry verticals. Yep. And most importantly, the what and the how is easy and visible. Ask why. why? And once you immerse yourself in that space, you know, you will not run out of energy in sustaining it. Because we now see a rise in explainable AI yeah. and the democratization of low code in terms of artificial intelligence. There's a lot of opportunities that are coming through the fore and South Africa cannot be left behind. Mm. You know, I encourage a lot of us that are immersing ourselves in the topic to open it up to students and graduates and make sure that when we are in a position to recruit, don't settle for we couldn't find someone with the adequate skills. There's a lot of women that have the skills and if you, can't, if you encounter someone that is giving you we couldn't find, they haven't looked hard enough. South Africa is rich with people who have the attitude, the desire, the drive, that just need an opportunity to prove themselves. And in this technology age, we cannot leave the youth behind, and they are going to assist us in really solving a lot of service delivery issues and give them that purpose. It's up to us to empower them with it. Thank you. With that said, we've come to the end and just in time because your lovely watch is telling you that it's time to stand. I <laughs> <laughs> love how technology works. But thank you so much. That was uh, Patrick Devine right on my, uh, on my right. He's a data security specialist at Solidate Technologies. Next to him, Clifford DeVert, the chief technology officer at Altron Netstar. And then next to me, uh, Tando Nsinzilana, who is a professional IT and telecom specialist. So... Again, at the, during the networking break, when we're done with the next panel, uh, as we break away, you're more than welcome to approach the three gentlemen if you want to engage in discussion. So thank you so much. Ashley. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mark.
right, so let's see if panel two can keep up by giving us, so we had three stories from Clifford, three analogies. So let's see if panel two can keep up with the kind of stories we've been getting. So the second panel that I'm going to welcome on, uh, we're going to be looking at fostering an enabling environment for green energy financing. And I'm going to welcome on stage Rashvir Manilal, who is the head of renewable energy sector at ABSA Relationship Banking. And then we have Dr. Patrick Nabal, who is the co-founder and chief technology officer at GoSolar. And online, we're going to be joined by Natasha Parmanand, who is the managing director for operations uh, within Sub-Saharan Africa at FedEx. And she is right there, so thank you so much for joining us. Again, in the same way that you've had uh, the opportunity to ask those questions, please do so. And uh, let's try not be shy this time in the room. Let's see if we can get uh, a few hands up uh, so we can get some in-house audience. But we are really appreciating the online questions that are coming through. So I suppose, you know, as I set the scene, there have been a lot of conversations around what uh, the just energy transition should should look like and I think different economies have different a pace of it will look different and at the same time that we've been talking about the just energy transition a lot of people started bringing in the conversation of sustainability and ESG and various other metrics that come with it and then at the same time we were talking about well the financing of all of these things that we're trying to achieve and where investors sit and what investors are looking for, et cetera, et cetera. So the conversation is quite fast, and I'm going to try in the short space of time that we have to try and hit the important key aspects that I suppose in all of this conversation that we've been having over the past few years, things have been lost or there have been misconceptions about what we're trying to understand. So Patrick, I suppose let me start off with you. Give us the landscape, the context of South Africa, when, it look, when you look at the energy landscape, what does it look like for you on the ground? And I suppose over the years, having been in the space. Happy, happy to uh, answer that question, but I think maybe we can just take a step back and think, is everybody familiar with what the just energy transition is? Let's see, hands in the room. Are we familiar with what the just energy transition is? All right, we have at least one person, two, three. Um, do you mind if I just sure. summarize it briefly? Yeah. Um, we could. The, it's a long document, and if we want to tie it to the previous panel, we'd put it in chat GPT until it's summarized. And what it would come out with is um, the just energy transition is about creating economic growth. You want to create sustainable job, and you want to reduce the carbon emission at the same time. And ideally, you want to do it fairly quickly. So if we look at this, and we look at it from a perspective of the South African context, what you all know very well, but the end customer is under financial pressure. We're very well aware of that. We are in an environment where power cuts have become the norm. Yes, you will tell me that we haven't had for a few weeks. Let's see what happens after the election, if it's a coincidence <laughs> or not. But I think it's fair to say that we, nobody believes they are completely behind us, regardless of progress at ESCOM and then you would be in an environment where the electricity prices are increasing with double digits regardless. And that's, we, we expect this to continue for the future as the investment needed to eliminate load shedding completely and have that just energy transition is huge. So you have this. So we have a landscape which is challenging. The good news seen from our perspective as a solar provider is that South Africa is one of the most attractive markets for solar conditions, really. It's sunny pretty much all the time. And then the technology cost has really gone down, which makes it available for more and more people to go there. Okay. So that is the context that we're in. So I'm, I'm curious from APSA's perspective, how are you seeing this narrative of the just energy transition? Because we've explained it here briefly, but are we all now starting to sing from the same page? And are we getting to a point where we are starting to spark that growth when it comes to renewable energy, et cetera? Yeah, uh, thanks, Nastasia, and uh, thanks for everyone for having me here. Uh, I think when you talk about just transition, just energy transition, for me, it really comes down to two things, right? Um, the first is skills development or reskilling. 
as we'd like to call it, um, and the second is localization. And on, on reskilling, you know, South Africa and I think Africa in general, we're a very coal-dependent continent and a coal-dependent uh, country in South Africa, I think. And that's primarily because of the types of resources that we've had. So a lot of the skills that we've got in the energy sector are people working in the coal uh, environment or you know, in that value chain. Um, and we can't leave them behind in this transition. So I agree with Patrick, you know, the, the transition needs to happen fairly quickly, but we've got to do it in a responsible way. I mean, we can't lose thousands and thousands of jobs and put thousands and thousands of, family, uh, of families uh, you know, hungry every night. Um, so we've got to start with that. Uh, I think it started. I, I think we've got to start doing it at a more accelerated pace, the reskilling of taking people from the, the coal industry into the renewable industry. Um, and then I think with localization, you know, and traditionally, uh, you know, I, I don't know if South Africa is being very good at this, with localizing um, new industries and new technologies, we typically will, and, it, and it's happening in the solar industry, where a lot of the technology that we're using has been imported, right? I think we've got to start figuring out how we localize that and we use, uh, you know, local talent in order to build that, uh, that industry going forward. Well, I'm curious, at some point, we'll hear from uh, Patrick in terms of his ideas on how we do uh, localize that and, and work on, on those skills. But Natasha, let me bring you in here because when we talk about the just transition, one of the things that came out in the conversations around it over the years is that let's not forget the social aspect. Let's not leave people behind. And when we think of the social aspect, you know, we then bring in the idea of ESG, et cetera, and some have come and said, well, let's rework ESG so the S comes first and then the E comes later for certain countries, particularly on the African continent. How are you looking mm -hmm. at the linkages between that just energy, the just transition with ESG, with sustainability? How are you linking those two from your perspective as FedEx, particularly the sustainability part? That's an interesting question, Nastasia, but thank you very much, everybody, for the opportunity. I'm sorry I couldn't be there with you guys in person. Um, if you look at it, ESG is it's, it's, an, it's an integrated philosophy, right? And it's an integrated um, planning that needs to happen. We have environment, we have social, we have governance. And I hear you, Rashir, um, and it, it makes sense that you can't leave people behind. And we know that from a South African context perspective, energy is at the forefront of discussions. From a FedEx perspective, we have to combine ESG. We, we can't put one before the other and leave another behind. So we take a very integrated approach. And what's interesting is if you actually look at it, right, 60% of our global consumers look at sustainability as their purchase considerations. Interestingly enough, 46% in South Africa look at sustainability and the environment in driving their purchase considerations, notwithstanding the fact that it actually comes at a higher price. So I think if we prioritize any one of the three, we're going to put, we, we're going to leave something behind. Um, and we're not going to sit on a level playing field, which means we're going to have to then put our hand out and walk a journey of pulling something behind. So the way we approach it from a FedEx perspective, and we're seeing that evolution and movement in the transport industry specifically, where we actually look at it holistically and we take a three-pronged approach. I want to stay with you for this one. I mean, when it comes to the justification, when you're talking to your stakeholders who want to understand your ESG uh, journey, how do you balance? Uh, do you look at it from the finance side, from the business? Uh, what's the business case here, or are you looking at it as a value uh, side of things? Do people uh, are your stakeholders uh, understanding the value aspect of that ESG, or? Is there still a little bit more to go when it comes to them getting it? So, I actually, when I was listening to the previous panel, right, and um, I, I think it was Tando who said, you know, it's difficult because you've got a financial officer sitting in the room and you've got to take them on this journey. And, you know, they're counting the dollars or the rands and, it, and it's difficult for them to get it because they need to outlay. And with this very, very challenging you know over the last few years we had covid we had then post covid um and it's difficult to navigate the economic imbalances that have come and emanated with change in the journey so we are sitting globally with a very very tough economic um landscape 
so yes, you know, you, I, I think what's important for us is to have the same vision and the output. But if you want a very simplistic answer, it's the value proposition. Because if you can sell the value proposition of this is the investment, this is the benefit, and this is the ROI. And the ROI does not necessarily need to equate two rands and cents or dollars in our case, but it will be a natural consequence of thereof. I mean, and I'll give you a really, really good example, right? 73% of our Gen Z consumers are willing to pay extra and premium price for sustainable packaging for uh, from companies that have an integrated ESG and sustainable um, ESG strategy that's been in place and that has shown um, commitment and sustainability. FedEx, for example, we embarked on, 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 on our sustainability, and I'm using the word sustainability quite loosely, right, um, 13 years ago. And it's been an increase in our cost base because you obviously now need to displace the easier, cheaper way of doing things. But what that's led to is 143% more packages on a daily basis, which talks to the point. Um, so when we speak to our stakeholders, the stage, and you, and, you, and you can fairly appreciate, you know, we are a New York Stock, Stock Exchange listed entity. Um, so we do have to put forward a value proposition to justify the initial outlay, because there's always an initial outlay. Right. Uh, Patrick, let me come to you here. When it comes to the, those narratives around um, the just transition, what are the misnomers or some of the things that fly over people's head? I suppose one may, people may think, well, the just transition should only be for developed countries or for the rich. What are some of the other misnomers that come with that, uh, those two wordings, just energy transition? Well, the... Um, uh, the just energy transition, it's very easy to, to put it back, all the issues we have. Mm -hmm. um, we, if, you, if we see it from our perspective and you look at a solar solution, um, there would be three primary reasons for getting it. The first one would be to say, and that goes back to what I was saying previously with right. the customer being under pressure and having to focus on the short term. So the three reasons could be to get rid of load shedding, um, achieve saving, savings, or because there's a climate challenge that we need to solve. A year ago, we did a survey, and we're quite surprised to see that the number of customers in our customer base that get um, an alternative energy solution because of its climate impact was actually very low. We were down to about 2 to 3% of the customer base. So if we want to contribute to, to the just energy transition in that kind of things, we, we can do it we can't do it because we have an idea of what's right to do. We do it because we need to be able to tackle some of the challenges people have straight away. Right. So it means that they're all very happy to contribute to better climate, but it needs to, at the end of the day, it means to impact the pocket directly. If you, if you just do it for the sustainability, it's going to be difficult to go forward. And then it remains one of the concepts and one of the concepts that is only for the rich. And this is where the emergence of new business model in the last 12 to 18 months comes there. Because if you go three, four years back in time, it was only the wealthy that could afford the um, a good solar solutions for their home. And it wasn't accessible to anybody else. And it wasn't even a dream for anybody else. But then you have new models that come in that being financed by the bank or rent to own subscription model or other things that we haven't even thought of yet. It starts to make it available to more and more people. But to be fair and, and transparent, the, the pool of people has grown, but it's not accessible to everyone yet. So it's about finding new solutions that make it accessible for everybody, such that this concept isn't just for developed countries, but it is there to help put the company on the growth path. It creates job replaces, hopefully creates more jobs than what it's replacing elsewhere, and then also benefits our children in the future. What I'm hearing then is the idea of inclusivity, not leaving anyone behind, which is some of the bits of the conversation we were having from the first panel. Let me say with you here, Patrick, I'm curious, the vision for Go Solar. Take us through that because it ties into the idea of, uh, let me loosely describe it as uh, democratization of, let's call it energy or electricity. How does Go Solar work? Simple, solar in every home. Um, 
That doesn't mean that we will put panels in every single home, but it means that we need to come up with concept that makes this available to everyone in the form or another. Okay. Let's expand on that. So solar in every home, any home or certain homes? How does, this, how, how does the vision go from looking at it from solar in every home? So when um, the company is young enough that a lot of us have been there since the start. And one of the premise for the firm mm. was that we would try to find solutions that would be available to more or less, I, don't, I can't say everyone, but it would yes. be for the vast majority of the population in South Africa. We were um, grateful to have some people that came from the fiber industry where they have been through that same journey for the past 10, 15 years, where you start giving fiber to certain home and then you go down and at the end of the day you come up with a model which brings fiber into township, but you have to come up with something else and that's one of the fastest growing sector for them. Right. So our um, um, ambition, and I can't tell you what we will do because we haven't figured out yet, but our ambition is to come up with similar concept and products that we can roll out everywhere, which will mean that people that are less fortunate than others will have access to reliable and clean energy in the future at a very affordable cost, and hopefully that will help bridge some of the differences that we have. Speaking of that bridging, um, a lot of it kind of depends on the financing side of things, which is what you uh, touched on a little bit earlier on uh, in your response. Rashfir, let's come to you. I mean, the main factors that you look into when it comes to financing the commercial side when it comes to solar installation. Yeah, so I think th there's a few, right? I mean, one of the biggest challenges we faced with now is the almost this bursting of this industry where, uh, you know, previously you'd have CCTV installers um, now wanting to install solar, right? So two years ago, they were installing uh, CCTVs and now they, they're in the solar industry or they were just electricians. And I think that's something that's of risk for us, right? I think we, we spend a lot of time uh, vetting installers and ensuring that they're worth their salt and that the assets that we own that they're going to finance um, are not going to catch on fire tomorrow or like just not work, right? So I think that's that's the one, uh, the biggest aspect for us. There's also a lot of equipment that's coming in uh, into the country, right? I touched on it earlier in terms of, um, you know, a lot of installers, solar installers are importing uh, most of the equipment that they're, that they're bringing in. Um, you know, we tend to work only with tier one equipment. We obviously want uh, the warranties on the equipment to be longer than the period of finance so that, you know, if the batteries stop working after two years, it can be replaced and, you know, we're not taking any asset risk there. Um, I think, um, you know, in terms of the actual financing arrangements, so within MySpace, it's the commercial um, financing commercial businesses. And I, I was hoping uh, Patrick would say that he's expanding Go Solar into the commercial space because then we could do a lot more business together with, with our clients while being competitors, I think. But, uh, you know, uh, it, typically banks would finance these assets uh, up to a period of 10 years. I think the different banks have different parameters, uh, obviously, but depending on the risk profile of the clients, you know, we can go up to 10 years on, on the financing. Um, I think interest rates have been, I think, quite attractive up until now in terms of, you know, linked to prime. Um, and, you know, loan to cost as well have been, you know, you can, you can finance the entire installation up to 100%. Um, obviously, risk, risk profile dependent as well. Um, yeah, I think those are the main, the, mo the main financing considerations. I think we also want to look at what the payback period of, of the installation would be. You want to make sure your client is cash flow neutral or cash flow positive early on in, in the installation so that there's no impact or negative impact on the business in terms of paying back the loans. Uh, Patrick, for somebody who's in this industry, in the solar industry, in what way have you seen um, the solar industry grow over the years and what are the drivers? Is it just load shedding or are there other aspects that people consider when they say, well, I'm thinking of having solar installed? Um, go four years back and you're lucky to find a house with solar panels on its roof. Uh, it was very rare that maybe they were... 10, 20,000 homes that had that at the time. And although we are nowhere near some of the countries worldwide, take Australia or California, Netherlands even, uh, there's, it's much more common and you start seeing them more or less everywhere. So there has been a big growth. And, the, and that can be 
disappointed in the solar industry having the best marketing agency in the world, which works for free for us and doesn't ask for anything. Escom in day. I'm so very thankful <laughs> for for their contribution to our industry and the growth. But load shedding has obviously been a massive factor for residential homes. Go a year back, the the number of calls that we and January last year, we had over 18,000 requests for installation in a month and we're clearly not geared for tackling that. And that has sparked a lot of interest and the reason why the CCTV guys and all those guys going there is that they saw that huge boom in there and they wanted to transition to it. Um, load shedding has been a huge factor, but with increasing prices, decreasing components, we are in a place now where the saving components becoming more and more important. We see huge value in that, in the sense that the customer that are getting solutions now, they get it for the right reason. It's a long-term investment. It's not something that you do to release a short-term issue. Commercial has been around for much longer. Uh, the cost component and that safety, energy safety there has been main driver. Can, sure. can I add as well? I think you know within our portfolio, we actually did a sort of a back of the matchbox exercise, right? I think. Sort of early last year, we saw that whenever load shedding would go to stage two and lower or stage three and lower, the demand in terms of new requests for financing on commercial installations would slow down uh, with about a two, two to three week lag. And then as soon as we uh, we'd go back to stage five and six, two to three weeks later, we'd see the demand for solar installations pe peaking again. Since the beginning of this year, that's changed. It's just constantly new requests for solar financing, right? And I think, you know, to your point, it's no longer just about load shedding, right? It's uh, co especially in the commercial sense. There's a massive saving to be made. And remember, businesses are not only using ESCOM. When there's no electricity, when there's load shedding, they're using diesel generators, which is a massive cost, right? I mean, that's like between anything between 8 and 12 rand per kilowatt hour to generate electricity. And also, they're not meant to be used during stage six load shedding, so they break down quite often and they need to be serviced quite often. So we don't even take that saving into account. And even just with the, the reduction in ESCOM bills, we've seen clients making savings as early as year three into the installation. Natasha, I want to bring you into the conversation because when Patrick was talking about how the industry, especially from the solar side, has evolved over the years, it then brings me to you know the idea of um, when we talk about that sustainability and that ESG, how have you seen those conversations change over the years? And I'm curious, uh, within FedEx, do you have somebody who's dealing with sustainability? Because one of the roles we saw uh, pop up over the years was having a chief sustainability officer or somebody who's working within the organization to make sure that the ESG metrics within a company are tangible but also achievable. So before I even answer that question, Nastasia, if you can just allow me, right? I want to go back to what uh, Patrick and Rashmi are saying. It's not just about load shedding. Um, honestly, the residential consumers, um, if you look at your tier two and your tier three consumers, um, it just it started becoming untenable from a cost perspective for them to afford um, electricity. Um, and, uh, and when you actually almost upskill the knowledge of your of your different sectors in terms of, yes, it's going to be an outlay of money, and we're going to need to save for that, but the ROI you're going to get, and obviously in very simplistic terms, and then you see that people are starting to benefit from it, because at certain points in time, people just physically could not afford electricity and just did without it. So, yes, price is definitely, I would think, you know, a contributor and load shedding coupled with that just took it, tipped it over the edge. From a FedEx perspective, you know, pivoting back to your question, um, yes, we do have a chief sustainability officer. Um, we, in fact, have an entire department um, uh, from a corporate perspective that's dedicated to ESG that filters to every single country. So every single country in FedEx is responsible to achieve certain me metrics. Uh, from an ESG. So it is top down. Um, it's something that's inherent in our DNA. And we've got a strategy that we take, which is called reduce, replace, and re revolutionize. And that is, you know, to, to make sure that our, our, our pickup and delivery and our solutions move um, to a carbon neutral position by 2040. 
Um, but it's not just about um, electricity. You know, we've gone into vehicle electrification. We've launched in 2021 electric vehicles, and we're not just seeing the saving uh, from a from a fuel perspective, but we're seeing an increase in terms of customers because they are now like, wow, you know, there's a there's a company that's doing more. Um, we have ESG reports that's part of our annual financial statements that are reported publicly. We have to report to shareholders on a monthly basis. And you're right, a few years ago, there was this new thing that came up, uh, you know, chief sustainability officer and um, what are your carbon emissions? What's interesting is um, in terms of world's total carbon, 7.7 gigatons belong to the transport industry out of 35 gigatons. So there's so much that needs to be in the trans done in the transport industry. Um, we've gone, you know, in terms of paperwork, you know, from a FedEx perspective, logistics company perspective, we have to provide lots of documentation, customs clearance documentations, et cetera, to our customers. Our customers want to retrieve it. They need to supply it. We've got completely automated in terms of that. Um, you know, our, in terms of our global pickup and delivery solutions, we've committed globally by 2040, we will be carbon neutral. And we've already started with natural vehicle replacements in terms of electric vehicles, um, EV structure readiness. We've also, um, from a light perspective, light sensitive. We've, in fact, where I'm sitting right now, we've combined three facilities, facilities into one. Uh, we've, gone we, we've already launched our electric vehicles. We rely in terms of, we've got motion activated lights and we rely on, um, uh, you, know, you know, we've got rainwater storage to, to reduce reliance on, on, on water. And then in terms of sustainability insights, what we, we've gone to the next extent because we're so aware of the sensitivity of our customers and the world as, as, and, the, and the global population as a whole in terms of ESG, we've gone and created a tool, um, FedEx Sustainability Insights, that allows customers to go on a portal and actually track the CO2 emissions per package. So you can actually track what we're doing from a sustainability perspective on a shipment that you are moving. Natasha, I'm going to put you on the spot here because I actually quite like doing that. But I want to gain insights, uh, you know, from a FedEx perspective. When the stages of load shedding were quite heightened, we had a whole host of uh, JSE listed CEOs, whether it was ShopRite or GrowthPoint, talking about the impact of load shedding on their businesses. And part of that conversation was also about talking about how they were mitigating the impacts of load shedding because it was starting to hit margins. From a FedEx perspective, during those high stages, did you start seeing the load shedding impacts on your operations? And how have you yeah. navigated uh, around that? Was it thinking about solar? Was it thinking about getting generators? How are you thinking about you know, uh, managing the business given this energy constraint? Yep. So it, it's interesting that we talk just about South Africa. And I know we, we live in South Africa, it's South Africa. So I don't know whether to say we were fortunate or not fortunate, but we actually have a great, a, a, quite a large presence in Africa, right? Um, Zambia has load, load shedding 12 hours a day. On a good day, we, we're without electricity in Zambia for six hours. Um, so we've already had the taste of it before load shedding became disastrous in South Africa, um, how to navigate uh, our business. But the impact on your business is huge. I don't even think, you know, unless you sit in the role where you are managing the PL, I don't think you understand the magnitude of what load shedding does to a business. We've seen, and I mean, I just want to pivot a little bit away from FedEx. You know, we play in the, we, we have partnered with SMEs, SM, SMEs, because that's one of our strategic growth pillars from a FedEx perspective. Um, and we've seen customers decline year on year because their businesses just could not cope with the load shedding impact. So we've seen businesses literally close down. Um, and you see that, and that's why there's volume softness in from a from a from us from an Africa perspective. But from a FedEx perspective, yes, we've had to navigate it and how we've had to we've had to outlay capital because without the outlay of that capital, the impact to our business and our customers became absolutely. I would use the word tragic, because if we can't service our customers, the customers could not service their business, which had an impact on them. So it's a knock-on effect. 
we've had to outlay in terms of solar, um, which then also would, sp would speak to our ESG, right? But we, it accelerated it. So we've had to look at solar options. Um, we've had to look at moving away um, from, from a lot of things um, and, and start almost being innovative in the way we do things. Um, even manual intervention. So we've had to put in manual intervention to move away from automation because automation is reliant until we put in solar. We couldn't put in generators. Generators just became unsustainable to Rajvir's point. It became expensive um, and it impacts the price to your customer. Um, so yes, we've, th there's a few things that we've had to do from a corporate level in, uh, in South Africa, major one being solar. That's very interesting. Natasha Rush, what are your thoughts? Some of that. I think maybe not for companies as big as FedEx, but certainly in the commercial space. I mean, we've seen quite a few of our customers end up in business rescue because of load shedding. And obviously, when you're in business rescue, uh, it's, it's sort of counterintuitive for a bank to lend to you. But we've taken a view that, mm -hmm. you know, some of those companies actually ended up in business rescue because they couldn't operate because of uh, you know, not having electricity for 12 hours a day. Um, and we lent to them to put on solar to get their business going again. And actually all of them that we've lent to that were in business rescue for that reason are now out of business rescue. So I think you know, that's quite a good story, but I think the financial sector has a responsibility to, you know, and you know, it's not just getting a business out of business rescue. There's 10, 20, hundreds, thousands of, of employees and families that are dependent on that business. So I think, and that's where it's also inclusivity that's... Here we go, we give you a round of applause, well done. <laughs> thanks, thanks. Leave it there. All right, but let's stay with you for that then. Are there government incentives or, you know, um, stuff that banks can do, especially for those that are looking to install solar from a commercial side who, as a business, it has been impacting them? And maybe uh, to Natasha's point that the idea of having a generator is becoming unsustainable. So maybe they want to look at other uh, mechanisms. Do you offer that? Are there government incentives that we can uh, speak of? So there are a few, actually. I think, you know, the the governments and potentially there should be a few more, but I think the uh, government's starting to look at ways to spark growth uh, in the solar industry, not only from a, not only businesses that want to operate in the value chain, but clients that want to go you know, off grid and, and install solar. So I think one of the biggest ones right now, I don't know how many people know about it, but it's the bounce back energy scheme from, which is you know, uh, from National Treasury um, and executed through Saab with the commercial banks. So there's, for commercial banks, obviously APSA is participating as well, where you know businesses can get quite preferential rates. It's actually capped at prime plus two and a half um, in order to install solar, but you've got to have solar panels and not just be not just have a you know a battery backup system. So you've got to be generating power as well. So the banks are getting that funding at a preferential rate from from National Treasury, and and we pass that on. Um, I think uh, the other one, which sadly not many of not not any of the b commercial banks are involved in, but it's the Agro Energy Fund from uh, the Department of Agriculture, where there's quite actually very int attractive incentives for farmers in the agricultural sector who want to put on solar, and you know it's, it, it's actually very in attractive incentives or grants that they get from the Department of Agriculture to put on solar. Um, I think uh, there's obviously the sec Section 12B tax incentive, which uh, SARS uh, came out with. I think that runs until February 2025 still, so there's still some time to, to, to you know, benefit from that. And then I think if, you, you know, with, if you're financing it with a commercial bank, if you're financing your solar installation with a commercial bank, it's generally done in a commercial asset finance product, which means it's a commercial product, so you can claim back VAT from SARS. Um, so that 15%, and sometimes the bank will ask for that as a deposit, or it just goes back into your cash flow. So I think that's quite a nice incentive that we've seen clients or commercial clients take advantage of. Um, and then specific to APSA, I think you know we last year we had our SME solar grant uh, that we ran, where we allocated 50 million rand worth of funds for SMEs specifically that wanted to put on solar. So you could get up to 10% of the installation back as a grant. Um, or up to 50,000 rand. So, you know, we saw quite a bit of interest in the SME space on that one. Uh, but I think in general, you know, 
public sector and uh, or from government and from private sector, there needs to be a lot more being put out there in terms of incentives to, you know, to install solar, not only in the commercial space, but maybe even in the residential space, you know, to in incentivize individuals to start generating their own power and reducing their, their reliance on the grid. Patrick, your vision, um, as you mentioned, is to make solar affordable to millions in homes in South Africa. Where are you with that? And I suppose as he talks about that private-public uh, partnership in order to make sure that we help the, the businesses who need solar, how do we have that public-private partnership to achieve that vision of having solar in millions of homes in South Africa? I mean, how are you viewing it with the team? So the... The beauty of South Africa is that you probably don't need it. Okay. I can just go and get and find a great solution that that assists. Right. So we, for businesses, when we're looking at the incentives, there there are a few incentives, and yes, you could have more to facilitate and make it happen faster. Um, when you look at the residential space, there's nothing anymore. We had one incentive that lapsed in February this year and not renewed, what you could claim part of the panel. Mm. A section only of your new solar installation, um, you can claim that back from your taxes. That was there, but the moment is nothing. I think the when when we look from our perspective, there are a number of catalysts that we need in order to to go fast. And incentives is even not even one of them. Um, but we access to capital is essential, and I talk about it as a catalyst, not a challenge, because the when you roll it out, it doesn't matter how you fund it, the cost is more or less the same. And we're talking, just for a company, we're rolling out billions of rands worth of equipment on an annual basis. And we are fortunate to be in a country where the, the financing sector takes it to heart and all the big actors and other financing channel, they're really committed to making a difference because as you said, there's, there's the, um, the just energy transition, but that's one aspect of it. It's about saving companies. It's about making sure that you can continue your business as is today and, and grow. Further, so that's one of them. Now the um, th the other one, which is important, is in terms of regulation. So before we even talk about incentives, is like, and it's a little bit like the discussion we had with AI. Regulation is ten years behind where they should be today. The technology has advanced so fast and is advancing so advancing so fast that you we have breakers that makes no sense anymore. To give you an example, and the whole country, with the exception of Cape Town, which is a very new thing. One of the requirements is that you're a net consumer in the grid. You're not allowed to feed back as a, compared to what you put in over a certain period of time, and that varies a little bit. Now, for us, when we roll out an installation, the cheap component, really the cheapest one, is the solar panel, which is, uh, I'm not going to say it's becoming free because I would be lying, but it's, it's getting very close to, to being free. So putting twice as many panels as we do today, the capital cost difference is, is hardly anything. Now we could start feeding huge amount of power back into the grid, which would make it very affordable for every customer and benefit everyone, reduce the need for load shedding, and alleviate perhaps a lot to postpone when reinvestment in the grid happens. So we need, they, we, the regulation need to catch up, and once those regulations are there, then we can look at what else is needed to make it affordable for everybody. But that would be the, really the first step. Um, make it possible to feed back excess energy in an attractive manner um, and then have tariff structures that are appropriate for the type of transition we want to have. And once you have corrected this, I believe that the, the solutions that are available today will be available to a much bigger consumer group. And then the last bits of the market, you need to have new innovative solutions and they're coming, right? It's not just us, but India is doing that for, for hundreds of millions of people and we have it in many countries. So those are coming and they will be available soon. When we talk about residential homes, are we talking residential homes in urban areas or are we talking residential homes where you are looking to go into the townships? Um, how do you weigh that? With the, is it residential areas in typical suburbs like let's call it Santon or Centurion or are you also looking at perhaps even expanding your operations or that vision into the townships? So the, the product we have at the moment is not appropriate for township. Okay. Um, the minimum solution we have is too big and is not suited. And one of the, um, the limitations there is that you, you need, in order for the solution to make sense for you, you need to have a battery. Batteries are still expensive. Um, so, but that's changing rapidly. And as it changes, then we can come up with new solutions that are affordable and available for people in less wealthy areas. Um, when we started, and that's the, that's the fun story, so we... 
we were very much catering for the middle income segment, uh, but the, it was interesting to see that the first 200 customers we had were pretty much investment bankers that <laughs> wanted something which was five times the size of what we had done, <laughs> very different segments. But we, once every investment banker had a solution and they were there fairly quickly, then we, we could tackle the, um, the market we wanted. But there's a lot of education needed, which is another catalyst, is how do we teach people on the good that such a solution can do for you in the way. Okay. I'm glad you brought up uh, investment bankers, and, and I know you're not an investment banker, Rishri, but... Um, uh, <laughs> has our solution. <laughs> I, of course, I, that's good. You have a <laughs> client right next to you. So when you're sitting with the team as the head of renewable energy, or when you're having conversations with others who are in your position within the different other financial institutions, what do they say when it comes to the role of asset managers being critical in the success of this just transition? Do asset managers see themselves playing a big a, a part of that, or how do they see it? So I've had, funny enough, I was telling one of my colleagues who was here uh, before we started, a few asset managers approach us. To be very honest, I don't know what to do with them. Um, I mean, uh, they've got solutions. I think maybe we need to figure it out, right? But um, I think they do have a role to play. I think there's there's one, particularly one big installer that we work with down in Cape Town, um, who's now actually do, created a new division within their company to do asset management for renewables. Um, I can't say hand on heart that we are doing stuff with them yet. I think there's they, they have a role to play. I think we need to figure out. And you know, it's it's such an ever changing industry that every day you get thrown a curveball with new people wanting to do different things for the renewable sector. Um, I think it's going to be quite an interesting ride. So, yeah, you know, I can't hand on heart say that we're doing stuff with asset managers yet, uh, but there definitely is room for that. Okay, so I'm going to pause my questions and open the floor to questions in the audience. So if you have any questions, uh, please raise your hand. We've already got a few coming in online. So I'm going to start with the first one while... Um, Anyone in the, f uh, on the, in the audience, rather, wants to ask their question. Um, the first question, um, I think you can answer this one, uh, Patrick. It says here, what is the lifespan of solar panels? And the other question says, are all components of a solar panel 100% recyclable? So maybe you can touch on those two. If you take a solar installation, um, it's true for, the, for every space, really, the panels, the lifespan is exceeded, it's going to 30, 40 years now, and the degradation on an annual basis is fairly low. So they will stay here. The, um, when it comes to battery, that's the key <laughs> question. The technological advancement is so quick that we, we don't have, nobody has a battery that has been around for a long time. So we see, uh, we see that the technology is improving, we see that the warranties are getting longer, we see that the, there's performance is getting better and they're bigger and they're safer and all of that. Um, if I have to throw myself under the bus, I would say, like, it's not going to last you 10 years. At least that's not what we're assuming it will do. And then you have the inverter that will probably last you 10, 12 years, possibly longer in day. Um, now, if you look at the recyclable part of it, the, the panels, we can recycle all of it. Now, it doesn't mean it's being done. It's expensive. The view we have is that um, if you take at the country like Australia, they, they're talking about gigawatts, so, so millions of kilowatt of panels that are going to be phased out on an annual basis. So there's a huge research happening and a lot of new concept being there out there to try to find out how can we reuse it because you have precious material in there, there's aluminium, there's glass, there's a lot of things that can be reused quite easily. Inverter, you can recycle all of it. Um, pretty much, and then when it comes to the battery, that's the, again, you can, uh, but it's not being done at the moment. Technology is changing, people are looking at ways of doing this, they are valuable material in there, but we're not yet there where it makes sense to do that um, at a large scale, so you do part of it, but not all of it. But we are convinced, and that's one of the only way that the solar industry can really make a huge difference in the future, is that we, we must do what we preach. We say we install a clean solution on your house, then we can't just take it and dump it into the landfill. So by the time 
we start phasing out those components, we must have a solution in place on how we treat them in an environmentally friendly way to try to reuse as much as possible such that we can create more with what we have. So recirculate and not just, um, not just replace. So there's a huge drive to get there. We're not there yet. And that's the honest truth. So I don't know if anybody has differing opinions on the... Uh, not different opinions, but I want to weigh in because so I read a paper, I think it's about a year old, um, on an analysis that was done by a PhD student in India, actually. And the conclusion was that it's actually cheaper for OEMs to go and dump the stuff in the ocean than to go and recycle it because uh, it can be recycled. It's expensive, right? It's not economically viable. Um, and that's, you know, there was a huge call there for government incentives for the recyc recycling of solar assets that includes panels, inverters, and batteries, right? Um, so I think, you know, we spoke about regulation catching up to technology earlier in the, in the earlier panel. I think regulation needs to catch up to the solar industry as well quite quickly because if that regulation and the government incentives doesn't come, we're going to have a huge waste, e-waste pro e pro problem, right? And I think it doesn't make it very green then if we're dumping batteries, uh, you know, into, uh, into oceans. And, you know, another funny story, you asked for stories, so I'm going to give a story. Right? <laughs> okay. I, I spoke with an installer uh, recently, a, actually a battery manufacturer, not an installer, um, and he needed to code his batteries. So I'm, I'm not a techie, but he needed to code his batteries in order to speak to the inverters that he's, that he's putting down, right? Um, he would buy an inverter from China at a huge cost, commercial inverters, just to do the coding, and then he doesn't have a use for the inverter. So he called his buddies in China and he said, can I send you my battery for free, a lithium battery, and you do the coding for me, and then you don't have to worry about sending the battery back, but it's actually cheaper than me buying the inverter. And the Oaks in China said to him, we actually can't bring lithium into China anymore. The government's sort of made it illegal for them to import lithium because they, there's so much of lithium in China. So they're actually sending their waste problem to us, right? So, and I think we've got to figure out, and it, it speaks to localization as well, because I think the next few billionaires are going to be formed in the world on how to recycle these assets, right? So, and it's a huge opportunity. I'm not very um, entrepreneurial as my esteemed colleague here, but I think if somebody's got the entrepreneurial spirit, entrepreneurial spirit to do that, I think there's a huge opportunity with that. Um, Natasha, the other question here is, how do you work with the other, call it small businesses or other um, stakeholders within your value chain um, at FedEx when it comes to sustainability and ESG metrics? I mean, um, how do you make sure that you're building that from your existing processes? Um, do you find that easy or difficult along the value chain? Or are you finding that it's getting a little bit easier as you start working with the different stakeholders or different parts of the value chain? I think it depends on the sector um, and the audience. So certain sectors, for example, are a lot more um, they, they want to do ESG and they want to work with, with companies that have a strong ESG strategy and give priority to that. Uh, so, for example, in the wine industry, our wine packaging is biodegradable, eco-friendly, um, and, and, and that's how we do it. Because we don't just provide the wine packaging locally, it's an international offering. Some wine companies want it, like that's a prerequisite, and some don't. Um, we offer it as a standard, but obviously it comes at a price. Um, so that's an example. And, and another example would be um, we offer 100% biodegradable or recyclable packaging. Um, and we offer that. But as FedEx, that's a standard uh, that we offer. Some customers find it, we'd rather go to a cheaper, alt, a cheaper supplier than use FedEx because there's a cost element that's coming to the ESG component. But in terms of moving it down the value chain, our strategies are in place. Uh, we have certain metrics that we comply with and, this, and we go over and over and beyond in terms of innovating of how we work within the ESG parameters. Um, and from a supplier perspective, we 
strive and endeavor to ensure that the vendors that we onboard to provide our services are also ESG compliant. All right. Uh, the next question here, um, I don't know which of the two gentlemen wants to take it, but both of you can if you want. The question says, to what extent will the cost of living and rising energy costs in Europe and North America drive off-grid living? And also, what are the implications in terms of capital allocation for infrastructure if utilization is low? Sure. It's a tough one. We start at the same time. Yeah, well, let's go. <laughs> okay. um, so I think there's two parts to that question. I think maybe the second part, I didn't really get the first part, but the second part in terms of infrastructure, it's something I wanted to touch on is, I think, you know, we have a lot of IPPs. The IPP market is opened in South Africa, right? And we fund uh, a lot of them. So I think, you know, th there's a lot of production happening in terms of solar on a utility scale. I think the infrastructure challenge we're going to have and the capital challenge we're going to have is th on the transmission network because we have all of this energy being produced, but how does it actually you know, get distributed? And if that transmission network's not being upgraded, we still need ESCOM's infrastructure in order to, to transmit that electricity. And I think that's where you know, financing institutions and the, you know, the triple P's that you spoke about needs to happen in order for us to have the capital injections to fund um, you know, that expansion on the transmission networks. Um, it's not as easy as funding IPPs. I think IPP developers and solar developers are a lot more well capitalized and a lot more, uh, you know, they've, they've got better balance sheets than, than, uh, than traditional construction MP EPCs, right? Where they've generally taken a huge knock during COVID and everything that happened after COVID. So I think you know, the banks, I don't think, have figured out how we're going to fund the, the, you know, the expansion of transmission networks yet. I think we, we're testing in a few African countries right now as APSA. Um, the first part of the question, I don't know if you want to read it again. Um, so I will go back to it. It says, will this drive the off-grid living? So that is the rising energy costs and the costs of living. Do you see that at some point um, driving off-grid living? So... I wouldn't call it off-grid, right? I think in South Africa, it's, and you must also weigh in, Patrick, but um, it's dangerous to say off-grid. I think we all are dependent on the grid in some way or form. Um, I know in, in the city of Cape Town, they've now said that you can't do off-grid anymore, right? Everything's going to be tied into the grid. Um, I think it is, so, you know, in terms of the cost of living part of the question, being dependent on, remember load shedding can be solved, it's just that we need the money to solve it, right? Um, and the only way you're going to get the money is by the hiking tariffs. So I think the affordability of electricity in its generic sense or in its general sense right now from ESCOM is going to become a problem. I mean, me certainly as a consumer, it's, I mean, three rand somewhat now per kilowatt hour is it's becoming unaffordable, right? And definitely for businesses, we're going to have to pass on those costs to customers. So remember, as a consumer, you're not only paying for electricity as in what's going through your meter in your home, but you're actually paying for it in every product that you buy uh, because the businesses that you're buying from need to pay for electricity and the generation and manufacturing. Um, so I think it will be a cost of living dichotomy. Um, we've got to try and get as far off-grid as possible, but as in terms of fully off-grid, I don't know. Do you want to weigh in? Yeah, I would love to do weigh in. Um, I understand the dream of going off grid. It makes no financial sense whatsoever. The um, if you if I take my own example, so I have a I have a solution which is m managed fairly well. So in the period from the first of December to the end of March, I've used the grid on two occasions when the weather was very bad in Cape Town. So if I wanted to have catered for those two days in a period of four months, I would have had to have a solution which was four times the size of what I have. And then I would be wasting the, the capacity so much during the 99% of the time. So what we see is that it's nice to take a, a step towards being off-grid where you can cater for the majority of your needs when conditions are normal, but you, if you want to cater for everything, it becomes so prohibitively expensive that it doesn't work. So you will need to have, uh, you will, unless you have a lot of capital and you're interested in getting there, and you can, and, and you accept sometimes not to have power because you, you won't cover for those things, then we'll need to have a mix of technologies, and that's how we utilize capital in an efficient way for, for the country.
Um, as we wrap up, Natasha, let me come to you here. When are we thinking about ESG or sustainability? Is it just only for big businesses or can small businesses think about it? I don't, I, I'm going to tell you that I don't think small businesses think about it. I think they're doing it and they're living it. Um, and we've seen that with the emerging SMMEs that are coming up where they are so conscious of packaging. They are so conscious about what they're selling, even to the extent of the product and the commodity of what they're selling, uh, where it's manufactured. And again, um, definitely there's a, a really, really, in fact, I would say ESG is more at the forefront of your emerging companies. Um, and we've seen that in terms of your small businesses. Um, I mean, you'll see online shopping and Instagram. I mean, Facebook Marketplace um, is one of the large, is, is if not the largest uh, revenue generating e-commerce platform. Um, and, you, and you see that. So no, I definitely think um, our small businesses have ESG at the forefront and sustainable, definitely sustainability. Okay, great. So with uh, a few minutes left, in 30 seconds, Rashvir, let's start off with you. What do we think about in this conversation around renewable energy and, and financing it and some of the um, aspects for people to think about um, at the end of this conference? Yeah, I think, um, and I'll draw parallels to the earlier uh, panel, right? I think any new technology, anything that you're considering needs to be done in the right way. You're going to you know, make the right considerations. You know, we're seeing a lot of, uh, so, so we've got certain conditions in terms of financing a, a renewable energy or a solar installation. Um, and a lot of clients don't like that. They don't like doing a structural check on their roof when they put up solar panels, especially when you're doing a commercial size installation. That's quite an important thing to do. You need to have a COC after you're done with the installation, something that our friend's company here does quite well, I know from experience. And you know, registering your installation with, with uh, ESCOM or the relevant municipality um, is another key consideration. So I think there's, you know, d d read up on the, on, on the do's and don'ts and you know, what, what should happen, what shouldn't happen when you do a uh, solar installation. Um, I met a client when I was traveling in the last few days who says he's gonna import his own panels from China, commercial client and his, his neighbor or friend's giving him an inverter, and then he'll go buy pa uh, batteries, and he's going to do the installation himself with his, with his electrician. Um, he's not going to get a COC. If that thing, he's not going to have comprehensive insurance. If that thing burns down, you know, he's in huge trouble. So I think it is an electric, it's a massive electrical installation that you're doing at your business premises or your home premises. Do it responsibility, uh, responsibly, spend a few extra bucks, and you know, get the right guys to come out and do it. Patrick? So much in my thought <laughs> that I didn't listen to the question, question sorry. That's perfectly fine. Um, in 30 seconds, what should we walk away with from this conversation that we're having around renewable energy and the financing of it? I have a very easy pun there. Which I think there's a huge ray of sunshine c coming up in South Africa. The, the, there's huge interest from a lot of actors going together, and we see a huge drive towards coming with innovative solutions that will benefit them more. In the environment we are in, that's really something that is motivating and exciting for, for anybody involved in the end that will benefit all. Natasha, let's wrap it up with you. In 30 seconds, what do we think about around the space of, I suppose, even renewable energy when we think about ESG, sustainability? What should the audience walk away with or perhaps even think about for the end of this conference? That it is not just about an outlay of capital, it is, like we said at the onset, it is a product, it is a solution, and if we think about it and change our mindset in terms of how we approach it, we're going to achieve what we need to achieve. So in 30 seconds, it's for all of us, it's as corporate citizens, as citizens of the globe, um, it is our responsibility to make sure that we help each other in this journey. All right. Thank you so much. Well, thank you as well to our partners, uh, Netstar, ABSA, FedEx, Solidate, and uh, Go Solar. And thank you so much to those of you who were tuning in online and sending in your questions. It's been a really uh, great conversation. And as I mentioned, the panelists will be around during the networking session. So if you want to engage with them and ask uh, questions, uh, you're more than welcome to do so. So thank you so much for tuning in online. And thank you so much for the audience for being with us in the room. Thank you.